Okay. Um, so uh, we're going to talk about Chef. So Chef is an open source um, framework for automation. Uh, it's similar in some ways to comp uh, competitive tools such as Puppet or Ansible or Salt. Uh, it's open source, so you can download the client and you can download the open source server as well. And then there's an enterprise version of it uh, in addition. You got it. Um, so there are my details. Uh, feel free to connect with me on Twitter and send me an email or something like that afterwards if you have questions. Uh, additionally, I have a lot of slides. I'm not going to get through all of them. I'm going to cover the basics of what you need. We only have four hours. Um, I can email you the rest of the slides that I have so you can kind of continue working uh, at home or in your hotel room or during drinks tonight or whatever. Your choice. So Chef is really meant to solve this problem that we have, and this problem is complexity, right? Our environments are getting bigger and bigger, and there's interconnection between all of our different machines that we might have under management, right? And so we have all of these different ideas of things that we need to manipulate and things that we need to change the state of. And so in the Chef parlance, these are what we call resources, right? So we need to define the state of these resources on our systems. Uh, and so in the olden days, right, when we just had one server, things were easy. Everything was on one server. But then we started, well, we needed to scale up, and we added a database, right? And then, well, we need to make the database redundant, so we add another database server. And then we make the app server redundant, and then we make, put a load balancer in front of it, right? And things just get more and more complex as we've grown, right? And now as compute capacity, because of cloud and other technologies, uh, compute capacity is very easily obtainable, and basically anyone can go out and get resources very quickly. This picture is actually really small. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And all of this infrastructure has a topology and a design to it, right? So the app load balancers need to talk to all of the app servers and needs to know who those are. And then the app servers need to talk to the cache, and then the DBs, well, the DBs need to be configured a unique way because it's not a hot, hot. It's a more of an active-passive type model, and therefore you need to know which one's the hot one and which one's not the hot one, and so forth. So there's lots of complex complexity in this topology. Um, and then you get even more unique things going on with like round-robin DNS and things like that. And everybody's infrastructure is different, right? Everybody's infrastructure is, unfortunately, in some ways, a snowflake. Uh, <laughs> So I like the fire there. There we go. <laughs> so we we grow and we grow and we grow and things get extremely complicated. And then you know, well, are we monitoring everything? And we've got all of this infrastructure to know about that we need to know and how things are related. And if this piece of the puzzle fails, how does it impact everything up the stack and so forth? Right. So we need to know that relationship. And that's really where Chef comes into play. So Chef helps you really identify what that topology is, the relationships between what we call nodes, those resources, and help you really essentially set them up so that they can be managed and kind of take away some of the complexity. So kind of the um, um, main tenets of Chef. So we try to provide reasonable sane defaults of like what you would see most likely out there in the wild. Uh, there's flexibility built into it. So one thing that makes us unique compared to uh, some of the other tools out there is that we are, we are written in Ruby. We use Ruby for a DSL. And because it, we do use Ruby at any point in time, you can use Ruby. And you can use the Ruby primitives to actually make your recipes or your configuration code that much better. Right? So if there's a complicated task that you need to do, you're not really stuck in our domain-specific language. You can easily break out of it. Um, and thus, you can provide libraries and primitives uh, that you have access to to actually make things easier for you. Uh, the, here's the other idea. If there's anybody from the Perl world, so our founder came from the Perl world, uh, there is more than one way to do it as kind of an overriding motto of Perl, right? Uh, and now it's an overriding motto of, of everything, <laughs> it seems like. Um, and as I said, same defaults as well. 
So some terms and uh, some terminology. So OHI, OHI is a framework if you need to get data from a server that's under management. So say for instance, there's a, um, uh, you're doing a physical server and there's an HBA card that you need to query and you need to get data out of and you need to use that in your automation. Then you could write a plugin to, if there, doesn't one, if there isn't one already in existence, you can write a plugin to OHI to basically query that data and then use that data in your automation further down the line. Uh, the Chef client is what runs on the actual nodes that you have under management. So this is kind of the intelligence in everything. Uh, there's what's called Chef Shell, which is an, kind of an interesting utility that kind of lets you debug Chef runs. We're not going to really talk about that today, but it's kind of an interesting thing to look at uh, as you mature in your Chef usage. There's Knife, which is kind of the primary interface that we're going to be using today. So uh, a Chef is only as good as his knife, and so Knife actually provides a plug-in framework that allows you to extend Chef and do um, a lot more than we've ever envisioned we could do with Chef. And then there's the Ruby language, right? Which we won't get into much today, but as you grow and mature in your use of Chef, um, then you'll get more and more into Ruby as you need to. So Chef is built on the premise of using an API for everything. So everything, um, uh, everything when you run a knife command, when you interact with the GUI or the web UI, you're actually uh, interfacing with our API. And so as we build in features, what we actually do is we will put in the feature usually first into the API and then we expose it in the clients. Um, there are some other aspects of the Chef API which makes it unique. So um, it's essentially an artifact server. Uh, so the most simplest way to think of the Chef server is an artifact server that's serving up, the artifacts just happen to be recipes, cookbooks, roles, uh, environments, and pretty much all of what we call the Chef artifacts or policies. Additionally, it stores a lot of data as well, and so this allows you to search that data. And so if you have what we're going to do today is set up a load balancer with two web servers, and that load balancer needs to dynamically discover uh, who those web servers are, and so that search service allows you to do it. Uh, and then also it allows you to very easily build kind of derivative services on top of it because it's an API-based approach, and we publish the API, it's open to you, and it's easily accessible to you as well. Um, so uh, it's under the Apache version 2 license. Um, we have hundreds of individual and corporate contributions. Um, the community itself is around 30,000. We have our annual user conference next week. We have, um, we're going to sell out, we're at about of 900 or so. We're going to top out at 1,000 for that conference. Last year we did 700 people at that conference, so we're growing um, from that conference perspective. The first year it was 350. And then, um, there's community.opsco.com where people can contribute in code and you can actually download that code and use it to get yourself up and running um, with something like, say, installing a MySQL database or something like that. I don't know why we decided to use Insane Cloud Posse there. Haven't found the history behind that one. but So how does this work? So there's this concept of infrastructure as code. So as Anyone heard of the concept infrastructure as code before? Anyone? Yeah? You laugh, but then am I asking a stupid question? <laughs> so the idea is that you can program programmatically configure and provision your infrastructure, right? And this should not just stop at the compute level. You should be able to do the network side of things. You should be able to do uh, the storage side of things and so forth. Um, in, in that, you treat your infrastructure code like any other code base. So just like you would have application code and you push it through a software development lifecycle, that's what you should be doing with your infrastructure code as well. So, so you should be writing tests. You should be making sure that those tests pass. You should be pushing it up into GitHub or, I'm sorry, Subversion. Uh, 
pushing it up into subversion and making sure that the merges happen properly and there's a whole process built around it, right? Um, I, after yesterday and the whole April Fool's debacle, I didn't want to mention Git, sorry. And so the idea is that you should be able to re rebuild your infrastructure at any point in time from this code base, right? And as you get into something like cloud, this is really important because maybe you have multiple clouds that you're using, internal, external, hybrid cloud, whatever. Now you have this portable component, then you don't have to move VMs around, you could actually move configurations around. So you can have two machines that are in two different infrastructure providers, and you're able to very easily spin those uh, spin instances up that are identical in each provider, except for maybe the underlying infrastructure that the cloud provider provides, right? But from that perspective, you don't care. Um, so things that are different um, from a chef perspective, so configurations, we generate the configurations directly on the node. So that's what kind of makes us different than other open source tools out there all of the evaluation is done at the node side. And the reason why this is important is because it allows us to scale very greatly. So one chef server can handle about 10,000 nodes. And this is just kind of like a, uh, an Amazon M1 large. So nothing, it's not even a highly available architecture. So you could actually architect it to be highly available with databases separated off the back ends and so forth. And you could actually get a lot more performance from it. But this is just kind of the general stat, is, is 10,000 servers per chef server. Uh, and so compare that to some of the other tools out there, the scalability is, 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 is reaches above what other people can do. Uh, and what's important about that is that when we do this evaluation, we're making sure that whatever data that we pull back from that node that we're trying to manage is the latest data, right? So uh, we'll get into it in a little bit, but nodes have data and we want to make sure that when we're using that data to do automation, it's the latest and greatest. And because we do the evaluation on the node, we know that we're going to have the latest data available to us. Um, we allow you to kind of, what we say, reduce management complexity through abstraction. So I was talking with uh, somebody from um, a CloudStack integrator and talking about how he should be doing something in Chef. And he wants to write things in Ruby or he wants to write things in Bash. And Chef allows you to put in what's called a Ruby block and you can execute Ruby. And it also allows you to put in PowerShell or it allows you to put in bash code and you can execute that, execute that code directly. The problem is, is that's not easy and friendly for the next person who has to come along and use it. So we allow you to kind of reduce that complexity of who has to manage it going forward by abstracting away that detail of that Ruby that needs to get ran or the bash that needs to get ran and putting it behind in what we call custom providers or custom resources to make it, basically make it a lot more cleaner for people to actually consume and use your code. Um, and then lastly, I've already kind of mentioned that, so store the configuration of your programs inside of version control. So basically storing the state of your infrastructure inside of version control. The other nice thing that I like about this is that it takes care of things like uh, uh, what ITIL wants with change management of who did what, when did they do it, why did they do it, and various things like that. And now all of that information from an audit trail perspective is in version control. Um, so our interface, so really what we do is we say, uh, we define the policy. So you're basically saying what you want to do, not necessarily how we're going to do it. Uh, and then the other model that makes us a little bit different is that we're a pull-based model. So the daemon sets there and periodically wakes up and will pull down the policy. There are a couple different ways that you can actually instantiate that daemon to wake up and do a check-in and pull down the policy if you want something to happen right away. But generally speaking, it's a pull-based model, which in some instances actually works better. So if you're in a legacy environment and your infrastructure is not uh, cattle, but they're pets and you keep them around for a very long time and you have like a three-year life cycle on your servers or something like that, if a server's down for a little while, the problem with the push-based method is it, always, it was always hard to understand when that server died, what all did it miss during the time it was down, uh, and then how do you bring that server back up to the spec? When it's a pull-based model, the server wakes up, he says, hello, this is who I am. What is my infrastructure state right now that I need to define on, on myself? 
Um, and so it's kind of a better model in that kind of traditional infrastructure perspective. All right, so some terminology and then um, let's see how far we are. And then we'll start getting in, into some more stuff that you guys are interested in. Um, so this is actually just a really simple definition of installing Apache, right? So we have, uh, we're gonna, this resource, and I think this builds, no. This resource says, I'm gonna install a package named Apache 2. We don't care about where it comes from, we just want an, Apa a, an Apache package installed. Uh, this is going to be the configuration, and then the state of the service needs to be enabled, and it also needs to be started. So if it was disabled and not running, we would turn it on and then we would start it up. If it was enabled but wasn't running, we would just start it up. And so the, you, uh, the unique thing about Chef compared to older configuration management utilities is that we're what's called item potent. So if there's nothing that we need to do and there's nothing that we need to change, this is gonna behave the exact same way every single time that it runs. So you wanna make sure that it's repeatable that you, then the problem with bash scripts a lot of times is they aren't repeatable. You run it a second time and it's gonna throw errors and complain and things like that. You can continue to run this recipe over and over and over again and you'll get the same result every single time. You'll get the server with the correct template and the correct state of the service. If it's all set up, you'll get the exact same thing because it's already set up the way we want it to be. So a chef node, so a chef node is where chef runs, right? So it's where chef client is installed and periodically checks in. Uh, what's interesting about this is that this can be, it doesn't have to be a server. Uh, it could be a switch or uh, in some cases if there's uh, a storage device that runs Linux or something like that, then we could actually run on that as well. So an example is Arista switches. You can install chef client on Arista switches and then that just becomes another node that you can actually manage, just like you would manage a server. Um, as I already said, nodes do all the heavy lifting. Nodes are also kind of the authority about themselves, right? So um, in, I'm working with somebody and they're doing automation and they have like a different configuration file for every single server that they would be running a script on, right? Um, that's not how you would do it in Chef. The way you would do it is you would have one configuration file and then the node would actually put in data about itself into that configuration file to set it up properly. Um, all of the information is stored on the server when you use Chef server. So there's another mode that you can use Chef in. It's called Chef Solo or Chef Zero. Uh, this, you don't need the server infrastructure, but the problem is, is you don't get the search capabilities to kind of build out this larger architecture and topology as well. And then all of its data is indexed for search, as I already talked about. Um, so you can search for nodes. Uh, you can find the topology data, IP address, host names. I'll actually cover this more here in a second. Um, so when you have this and you have to add in a new node, what Chef allows you to do is kind of automatically do this by being able to search. Nagios can search for the new node that just got added. This node has intelligence to be able to search for, okay, what's my memcache cluster, what's my Postgres slaves, and so forth. And that's really, really what you kind of want in a large scale, web scale environment, being able to dy dynamically uh, scale up and add those components. So here's all the possible changes that you might actually have in this scenario. Um, so 12 resource changes for one node addition and doing all that by hand could actually be very time consuming and difficult. Um, so this is how Chef looks from an infrastructure perspective. Um, there's the server, it stores all of its data. Periodically the nodes check in and the nodes can be virtual machines, physical machines, cloud instances, switches, we don't care. It's an operating system, we can manage the operating system. Um, additionally, this could actually be um, the client running and the client could be calling out to APIs. So one example, so in a, the conversation with the uh, CloudStack integrator today, we were talking about, well, what you would want is a resource inside of Chef. So you could say CloudStack underscore zone, the zone name, 
And then you could dynamically configure a cloud stack zone or cloud stack cluster or something like that. What that would actually do is on the Chef client, it would call out to the cloud stack API and make whatever changes it would need to make on the API and store that data as part of the node data, right? So it's what I would call is kind of like an API proxy server. So if there's storage APIs you need to hit or, uh, and there's another example, EC2, right? So if you wanted to create a load balancer in EC2, then there's a cookbook or a recipe that allows you to do that. Although we, we would want to do it in cloud stack, right? So let's talk about knife. Uh, so knife is really, if you're a command line junkie, then you're going to be using knife a lot to interact with the chef server and your nodes. Um, Send some kind of common commands that we use. So knife node, you can create a node, you can edit a node, you can list out all your nodes. Uh, knife cookbook, that's for actually uploading, deleting, downloading cookbooks and things like that. Uh, knife role is for interacting with what we call roles, which I'll talk about that as we progress. And then knife environments as well. So um, you can have a collection of servers. All of those servers can go under one environment. If there's some common aspects that you, all of those servers need, then you can define that common aspect in an environment. Uh, so say maybe a database, a database connection string or something like that could go in the environment. Uh, and then every single server that are in that environment would have that connection string available to it. Uh, roles are things like, say you have a web server role and the web server uh, installs Apache and configures Apache the way you want it, but then you could create a second role for a particular application that may use Apache, right? So it's a set of servers that kind of have a common task or a common goal. Uh, some common commands that you'll be using, which we'll be using today. So knife bootstrap, it essentially SSHs or does a WinRM to a node and uh, installs the Chef client. And then it can also register with the Chef server and then initially bootstrap the node with a particular role. So in this case, we're gonna make this a web server, right? Um, so knife CS. So knife CS is something we're going to use. Uh, if you've already installed, who, how many people have installed the Chef client that I handed to you on the key? This is like a couple of you, okay. Um, so you might just wanna go ahead and install that. The other thing you should do is get your account set up with either Vario or Exascale so we kinda have those things out of the way. And when it comes time to start typing in commands, we have that down. Uh, so knife CS, this is actually very truncated output, um, but knife CS is knife cloud stack. It's a community contributed uh, plugin to knife, and it's actually contributed by uh, one of the companies in the room. So Schubert Phyllis, some of their guys actually contributes it into it. Uh, another guy from Dell also contributes uh, to this project as well. And it essentially allows you to interact with a cloud stack server. So um, you can see all of the different commands that you can run. And this is actually just a few of the commands. And so what's awesome is you can go in, you can do knife CS service list. You get all of the services that you have uh, on offering. Uh, you do knife CS template list. Uh, and this is actually out of Vario. So this is all of the templates that they provide. Um, so if you want to create a simple web server, it's as easy as running this command right here. So that's a little of a long command. Um, but essentially, knife CS server create the name of the server and then some flags that you need to pass it. So the template we're using, the service we're using, uh, the SSH user, and then tell it to actually use the cloud stack password. If we want another web server, uh, then it's as easy as running the exact same command but changing the name of the host. Right. Uh, adding in a load balancer, you know, once again, same command that we need to do. Um, so let's talk about search a little bit. So if we wanted to stitch these three servers we just created together, uh, we can do search. So if we run nice search and the item that we want to search on, then you'll actually get back nodes. And we're going to do all of this, so I'm just kind of just setting, setting things up for you. Um, 
so what's, what's awesome is inside your recipe, you can actually do the same thing. So inside of the recipe, we want to find everyone that has this particular role that we care about. And as part of that, in our configuration file, our HA proxy config, we're actually going to write out a configuration line for each node that we discovered inside of that search. So if we added a second web or a third web server, it's going to happen automatically for us. So the only two things would need to happen. We would need to bring up the node and bootstrap it as a web server. And then the second thing that we need to do is tell the app load balancer to run Chef Client to actually update itself, right? Um, so you can see the servers that you have available to yourself. Um, and then uh, if there's data that you want, then you can actually play around with knife search and get the different data back. Uh, so there's tons of data that all the machines report back on by default, and you can use that data for whatever you might want to do. So in this case, the dash A says, show me these attributes. Um, so management of servers that are up in CloudStack that you own, you can actually then go in and perform all of these different tasks against them, against them if you want. Um, so it's similar to the Cloud Monkey stuff, right? Uh, the nice thing is, is it actually hooks into Chef, so if you could actually have configuration management on top of it. Uh, and then the other really awesome thing is that if there's a stack of servers that you want to create, so uh, more than one server like we just did, so we created three servers uh, or four servers by everything was done, if we wanted to actually create all of them at once, uh, Knife CS, and this is actually the only Knife plugin that I know of that has this functionality, uh, you can create a stack of servers. So you specify in a JSON file. It's really, really small, but it'll be larger when we go through this. Uh, so I specify I have two web servers. This is what I want installed on them. And then I'm also going to create a load balancer, and then this is actually truncated. But basically, you supply this JSON file, formatted correctly with the right information, and then we'll spin up uh, all of those servers that you need for this particular infrastructure. So I don't think I need to cover these two slides. I think everybody understands why the cloud or why not the cloud. Um, what's kind of interesting is this idea of data gravity. So as you talk about moving things to the cloud, where your data lives is really important. And so um, there's this concept that machines move as close as possible to the data that they need to actually do their job. And the further that you get away from the data, then you start to have like cap theorem problems, so consistency, availability, and what is the third one, partitioning. Uh, and that's when you have to start to take into account those things. Um, what is awesome about Chef is that you need to have a, an escape plan for every infrastructure provider, and you need to be able to move that data around as needed. Um, what Chef really gives you is this idea of infrastructure portability. So if, God forbid, you would want to use Knife OpenStack, like hell froze over or something, right? That's supposed to be a joke. You guys are supposed to chuckle at that. <laughs> there we go. Thanks. Uh, just makes me feel better. It just may not be funny to you guys, so just laugh because it's... Um, but there's, there's lots of different plugins that allow you to interact with different cloud providers. And the nice thing is, is you can really move between all of these different providers when your infrastructure code is defined in something like Chef. Because now all of those changes and everything that's different is defined in your infrastructure code. Uh, and if you have it up in Subversion or something else, some other source control repository system, uh, you can very easily move those configurations between the different environments uh, very easily. So, um, so basically, so every infrastructure is unique. So all of these different providers are unique. You can abstract away those differences. Uh, and then you can understand the cost of what those different platforms mean to you. And if you needed to move between them, then you could. And it'd be the same way for different cloud stack providers, right? So if you were wanting to move between Exascale and Vario or Vario and Exascale, then you have things defined in your infrastructure code, and you can do that very easily. And 
Then we're going to start talking about, uh, we'll talk about attributes, we'll talk about roles. Um, there's a lot more to learn, though. So we have uh, really a lot of what we're doing is around workflow helpers and testing frameworks right now. So it's kind of like one of our primary areas of development. Um, and there's a lot that you can learn about this aspect of it. So there's things, what's called test kitchen, uh, chef spec, server spec, uh, food critic, and other things that help you write good, uh, good chef recipes. And uh, then there are some other things like LWRPs, which allow you to extend Chef to do functionality or ab abstract away complexity um, as well. We're going to mainly talk about roles and attributes and get some of this environment up and running for you guys. So what was that slide? Oh, so um, who has the client installed? Everyone have the client installed? So if it's the DMG, then you should install it. RPM, deb, install the chef client. After you install the chef client, uh, you need to run this command. And this command is actually going to require an internet connection. So make sure you're on the internet. We need to install the Knife CloudStack plugin. Uh, for those of you on a Unix-based system, stop before you type hit enter. Um, there's a path that you actually need to go to, so it's going to be um, here. So um, there's a lot of crap going on on that screen. Let me copy and paste it. So you want to make sure that you're installing this gem in the right location. So uh, for those of you who aren't Ruby programmers, a gem is essentially a package that gives you kind of a code library to do more functionality. Uh, this is going to take a while, because you notice we have to install 23 gems, because we just want one, because um, there's a lot of dependencies, because you need things like uh, knife windows and some other things as well. For a Windows user, you can actually, should just be able to type on the command line, gem, install, knife cloud stack. So is, everyone, is that working for everyone? Is it not working? The other thing on the Mac or Linux systems, so this is our own private installation of Ruby that you're manipulating. You're not manipulating your installed version of Ruby that the system provides. So we do what's called uh, omnibus packaging. And when we ship our client and we ship our server, we basically ship everything that you need to get things working uh, inside of one package. Makes our packages a little larger. But what it gets away from is um, having the right version of Postgres, having the right version of a particular gem and everything like that. And we can ship everything you need. It works the same way for the open source server. So what's really awesome is there's one command. You download the open source server. You install it. So there's more than one command. There'd be a wget. There'd be the package installation. And then the third command will essentially configure it uh, exactly the way you want it. So it's, um, I think it's chef, chef server control reconfigure. And it'll set the server up for you exactly the way you want. It'll install Postgres, it'll install RabbitMQ, it'll install Couch, it'll install everything that you need to actually have things working properly. So who has not completed this command? Still running? Yeah, it's going to take a while. So what questions do you have while we wait for RubyGems to let us download things? So while this is running, let's go shut up our Chef account. Um, so we offer, um, so I said we offer an enterprise version. We also offer a hosted version as well. And just for simplicity's sake today, we're going to use the hosted version. And um, you'll want to go to manage.opscode.com. And you should get this screen right here. 
So sign up for an account, type in your information. Um, Click get started. Oh, sorry, I'm not reading the instructions. There we go. Okay. And then you'll get this screen. Um, with this screen, you'll want to click on Create New Organization. Give it a name. This name actually needs to be unique across everyone inside of Chef. So make it something unique to yourself. Um, I'll call it Michael Ducey Incorporated. And it'll validate it, make sure it's available. Your organization not available? No, it is. <laughs> oh. Um, We're all from the same organization. Oh, OK. Well, so the other thing is that you guys could sign up, and then you could invite them to your organization. But don't do that right now. <laughs> um, so click on Create Organization. And this will take a little while. This is actually one of the most expensive processes in the Chef server, is creating an organization. So don't navigate away from that screen, because there's something you need to download on that screen. You got it? Yeah, thank you. Yep. So what you want to do is you want to download this thing called the Starter Kit. Um, it's going to say, oh, no, you're going to reset your org key. That's OK. You didn't download your org key anyway. Um, and I'll talk about what this means here in a second. Click Proceed. And it's going to download a zip file, or a, yeah, a zip package for you. Zip file, I guess. You can see I download a lot of these. I'm up to six. <laughs> you don't have to wait for the client to do this. Okay, so I am, you don't need to do what I'm doing. I've got so many of these repos, I've got to move this one off somewhere that makes sense to me. Um, okay, is your client done yet? Whose client is done? Anyone? Couple people. So when, let me turn off this transparency too for a second. So you should be able to do knife node list. And uh, you should get nothing back, which is right. <laughs> and if you do knife, client list, you should have one client. So it should be your org name dash validator. So in this case, we've successfully connected to the chef server. We said, chef server, tell me what client keys are registered. 
Um, it's actually not your, yeah, it's your org name dash validator. So uh, I'll take a pause. Who's all at this point or who's all able to be at this point? Anybody? Uh, the key thing is you need to be in your repo. So you need to, I'm, I think I skipped this step. So unzip your chef repo, go into that directory, and when you're in that directory, then run that command. And the reason is, is because there's some hidden files. So there's .chef, and inside of .chef, there's configuration information. So you need to make sure that you're in that directory. So the way Knife works is that it looks for a .chef in the current directory. If it's there, then it will use that. Otherwise, it'll use what's in your home directory under .chef. How are people doing? Works. Works. Anybody else? Works. 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 Yeah, I'm not an engineer, so. He's a manager or something, right? <laughs> Works. Okay. I don't want to leave anyone behind, so I need like heads nodding and like, yes, it works. I'm good. Great. Um, so that's at the very most basic. We have now our Chef server set up and our. Um, um, configuration downloaded and we can actually use it. You notice that there's actually nothing useful really inside of cookbooks right now. Uh, there's nothing useful inside of roles either. So now what we can do is we can go in and we need to hook it up to CloudStack. And we do that by editing our chef. So actually let's do so how many people installed Sublime? Have that installed and working? So one thing that you need to do inside of Sublime is your preferences. You need to go to Browse Packages. And I have no idea what this is on Windows. And that um, package that I gave you, so there was the Sublime editor itself. And then there was the Chef, what was it called? Sublime Chef. Yeah, Sublime Chef Master. Uh, extract that Sublime Chef Master and then browse to where that's located. And then you'll find the actual, um, sorry. And you want to take it and you want to install it in this directory, at least on the Mac. So in this case, it's under Sublime Text 3, or in your case, Sublime Text 2 packages. And when you're writing something like um, Ruby, What, this, uh, what it'll allow you to do is you can start typing and it'll finish it for you. So there's the chef declaration to manage a file. Did you have a question? No. Okay. Uh, directory, right? And so there you go. There's all the information that you need to provide. Some of it optional, some of it not optional. But it kind of gives you this IDE type interface that makes it a little bit easier to actually develop chef stuff. So you want to open this knife.rb and inside of the knife.rb let me get the actual um, I love how the secret key or the keys are so long. Um, so you want to add these three lines. And for um, the cloud N. Let 
me log into Cloud N. So for the cloud end people, there's API key management right here. And you can get your keys here. The problem is they don't give you the actual API endpoint. Don't, don't try and copy down my private key real quick. Can you get it? <laughs> so you want to get this access key and my private key. This is like, and you know, be respectful, don't copy my shit, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, I don't care. I'll destroy this, hopefully. <laughs> uh, so I'll put in my API key. I'll put in my private key. Um, and then I need my URL. For Exoscale, let me pull up Exoscale. I don't know what I can put as my password. <laughs> I have this nice thing called 1Password and I don't use it half the time. There we go. API details. So you go to your account, you go to account details, and then there's API details. There's your API URL, your API key, and your secret key. For cloud and um, they don't tell you the API endpoint here. So if you actually go into the console for your comp compute, what it actually does is it goes and launches you into uh, the CloudStack portal. And you can pull this string right here. So you just need this right here. Um, and you can actually put that into your text file. And so that's what it should be for cloud end. Any questions? Anyone? The lines again? How's everyone doing? Thumbs up, thumbs down? Hand in the middle. Do we need beer? How yes. long have we been going? Yes. Yes? I was thinking of maybe arranging that. So we've been going just about an hour. So let's, um, let's, take, um, let's get this set up working, verify that we actually can connect to the CloudStack cloud, and then we'll take like a five minute break and then um, let you guys get some water, use the bathroom or whatever, and then we'll come back. So four hours is a long time to do a workshop continuously. So once these lines are in there and you've saved it, you should be able to go back to your terminal. And you should be able to do knife CS template list. And it should go out to your cloud provider. Your, di your output may be different if you're using Exascale. So I'm using Varial. Um, so there you go. That's what you should see. Work for people, don't work for people? I'm at line secret keys. Yes. Not there yet. OK. You're a hunt and peck typer, aren't you? I'm using Vim. Oh, OK. You're using Vim. Oh. Sorry for that. Should have paid attention, right? <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm, I'm a Vim guy. I just tease them. Uh, so. The two, bits, the two bits that you're going to need to go forward on the next steps that we're going to do um, is you need to run knife CS service list, and you need to get the service type that you want, so this name. And then you also need to run knife CS template list, and you get the template type back, or the template name back as well, right? So those two pieces of information we're going to need to run the next command, which we can do after break. Does, do people want to break or do people want to keep going? 
Will you drink five minutes? Okay, five minutes, then come back. <laughs>